Welcome back everyone to the Restoration Table. My name is Tony Fieldson. I'm an active believing member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. At the Restoration Table, we share our favorite gems from the Restoration and truly try to build bridges of understanding and friendship between people who have divergent viewpoints about the Restoration. If you like the content of this video, make sure to subscribe to the channel and let's get this next adventure started. In today's video, we will review 10 helpful keys for responding to a loved one's questions or faith transition. In modern times, most Christian churches have higher numbers of people that are leaving the church than in past generations. Today, almost everyone has a family member or a close friend who has left. It can be an extremely painful experience to navigate for both parties involved. I'd love to hear your story in the comments. What experiences have you or a loved one of yours had with challenging questions or faith transition? I'd love to know what has been the hardest part about it and what has been the most helpful to you to try to navigate through it. There is a lot of helpful information and tools out there to help heal relationships, reconcile differences, and continue to enjoy a loving relationship. For those encountering challenges to their faith and for those who have loved ones experiencing it, I hope the information in this video can help you better preserve and deepen your relationships in the midst of this journey. Helpful key number one, understand the nature of modern challenges to faith and the church's efforts to respond to them. From a 2020 BYU article, we learned that people are leaving religion faster than they are converting to religion, and that is especially true of teenagers. The 2016 General Social Survey showed that 75% of Latter-day Saints born before 1943 remained active in adulthood, where only 46% of Latter-day Saints born after 1981 remained active in adulthood. There are multiple reputable recent studies conducted that surveyed thousands of people about what their concerns are and why many of them have left the church. Three of the most notable studies include a 2013 study that was presented to church historian Marlon K. Jensen and Dieter F. Uchtdorf, a 2019 study, The Next Mormons, How Millennials Are Changing the LDS Church, and research conducted by BYU professor of psychology Sam Hardy to be published in 2021 entitled Empty Churches. These three studies demonstrated that there are three main concerns that lead people to leaving. Number one, discovering information, usually on the internet, that challenges their convictions of the core truth claims of the church, usually pertaining to the Book of Mormon, Book of Abraham, Joseph's polygamy, and various scientific challenges to the faith, among other issues. Number two, feelings of betrayal when they discover, many times in their middle or late adulthood, challenging things about church history that they never knew about, despite growing up an active member of the church. Number three, disagreements with certain teachings and policies of modern leaders, usually surrounding issues of inclusiveness, transparency, and handling of criticism, among others. In 2011, the church historian Marlon K. Jensen shared that the 15 men, the first presidency and quorum of the 12 apostles, really do know, and they really care. And they realize that maybe since Kirtland, we've never had a period of, I'll call it apostasy, like we're having right now. In recent years, there has been an increase of counsel from church leaders about navigating faith challenges like never seen before. For example, in the July 2020 Ensign, official church magazine, it included titles like, When Loved Ones Leave the Church, and When I Felt Deceived by the Church. In recent years, the church has done many things to address the top three reasons why people are leaving. Regarding reasons number one and two, which pertain to church history, church historian Stephen Snow acknowledged that being open about our history solves a lot more problems than it creates. We might not have all the answers, but if we are open, and we now have pretty remarkable transparency, then I think in the long run that will serve us well. I think in the past there was a tendency to keep a lot of the records closed, or at least not give access to information. But the world has changed in the last generation. With the access to information on the internet, we can't continue that pattern. I think we need to continue to be more open. As Terrell and Fiona Gibbons reminded in The Crucible of Doubt, which is sold at Deseret Book, our history, as portrayed in manuals and curricular materials, has historically been edited to portray Mormons at their best and the world at its worst. Episodes and actions that reflected poorly on the Mormon people were largely omitted or downplayed. Coming out of a legacy of bitter conflict, persecution, expulsion, and martyrdom, early Mormon historians felt no compunction about portraying the Mormon past as a black and white struggle between God's covenant people and Gentile oppressors. The trauma and unrequited murder of Joseph and Hiram in particular lingered long, not just in collective but in personal memory. Joseph F. Smith, Hiram's son, was not yet six when he stood by his father's bullet-riddled body, and he would preside over the church until 1918. His son, Joseph Fielding, who would have heard this account firsthand from his father, served as church historian until 1970. Doubtless such a past, coupled with a lingering sense of injustice and alienation, contributed to a protective disposition in church history writing and archival access. One of the most prominent examples of the church trying to share a more transparent account of its history is the Gospel Topic of the Days. 
which addresses 11 of the most controversial aspects of church history and doctrine. The essays can be found on the church website under Libraries, Gospel Library, Topics, and then Gospel Topics. These essays have not been advertised to the general church, but have been encouraged by general authorities in various venues. And M. Russell Ballard said this at a Seminaries and Institutes address. Church leaders today are fully conscious of the unlimited access to information. We're making extraordinary efforts to provide accurate context and understanding. A prime example of this effort is the 11 Gospel Topics Essays on LDS.org. It is important that you know the content in these essays, like you know the back of your hand. You should be among the first outside your students, families, to introduce authoritative sources on topics that will be less well-known or controversial. And an official church statement says that these essays have been approved by the First Presidency in the Quorum of Twelve Apostles. The church places great emphasis on knowledge and on the importance of being well-informed about church history, doctrine, and practices. We encourage members to study the Gospel Topics essay cited in the links below as they seek learning, even by study and also by faith. These recent efforts by the church have been met with a combination of praise and criticism from different parties, but most agree that it was a positive step forward in sharing a fuller account of church history and doctrine. Regarding the third major reason why people leave, which is disagreements with some of the modern teachings and policies, in the last decade the church has made many significant adjustments, especially under the leadership of President Nelson, to benefit the members, many of which adjustments have addressed some of the concerns people have regarding inclusiveness, transparency, and tolerance for criticism. Most people applaud these changes and are excited for more in the future. Helpful key number two, honor their questions. Dieter F. Uchtdorf instructed us that there are few members of the church who at one time or another have not wrestled with serious or sensitive questions. It's natural to have questions. The acorn of honest inquiry has often sprouted and matured into a great oak of understanding. And he acknowledged, some struggle with unanswered questions about things that have been done or said in the past. We openly acknowledge that there have been some things said and done that could cause people to question. In 2014, the First Presidency and Twelve Apostles affirmed that they understand that, quote, from time to time, church members will have questions about church doctrine, history, or practice. Members are always free to ask such questions and earnestly seek great understanding. In 2016, M. Russell Ballard boldly asserted, quote, let me make sure that you understand this important point. There is absolutely nothing wrong with asking questions or investigating our history, doctrine, and practices. The restoration began when Joseph Smith sought an answer to a sincere question. When someone comes to you with a question or a concern, please do not simply brush off the question. Do not tell him or her not to worry about the question. Please do not doubt the person's dedication to the Lord or his work. I am concerned when I hear of sincere people asking honest questions and then being treated as though they were faithless. This is not the Lord's way. And Dieter F. Uchtdorf gave us this crucial reminder. Latter-day Saints are not asked to blindly accept everything they hear. We are encouraged to think and discover truth for ourselves. We are expected to ponder, to search, to evaluate, and thereby to come to a personal knowledge of the truth. Brigham Young said, I am afraid that this people have so much confidence in their leaders that they will not inquire for themselves of God, whether they are led by him. I am fearful they settle down in a state of blind self-security. Let every man and woman know by the whispering of the Spirit of God to themselves, whether their leaders are walking in the path the Lord dictates. Navigating questions isn't always easy, but it's always worth it to engage in the wrestle. As Sherry Dutaw in a 2016 BYU Fireside, she said, We all have questions. Some are doctrinal, historical, or procedural. Some are intensely personal. Are you willing to engage in the wrestle? I recently engaged in a wrestle. When the policy was announced that the children of gay parents might not be eligible for baptism at age 8, I was confused. I didn't understand the doctrinal basis for the policy. The Lord wants us to ask every probing question we can muster, because not asking questions can be far more dangerous than asking them. Hubie Brown remarked, I admire men and women who have developed a questioning spirit, who are unafraid of new ideas and stepping stones to progress. Only error fears freedom of expression. This free exchange of ideas is not to be deplored as long as men and women remain humble and teachable. In 2019, a wonderful book came out called Bridges, Ministering to Those Who Question by David Osler. In one of the large-scale surveys, he conducted, he found that the large majority of people who struggle with questions feel like their leaders and loved ones are not adequately equipped to help them. And he found that the majority of leaders don't feel equipped to help people who struggle with questions. Patrick Mason, in his, in his book, Planted, Belief and Belonging in an Age of Doubt, gives us a great rhetorical question to chew on regarding this matter. Are there any places within the institutional structure of the church where people can talk honestly about their questions and doubts? 
Or must they suffer in silence, move to the margins, or be relegated to finding their only sense of authenticity and community on the internet? When individuals sincerely want to stay in the church but can't see any place for themselves here, and thus decide to leave, the body of Christ is weakened and we all lose. Helpful key number three, seek to understand, listen, and don't judge. Part of honoring their questions includes learning how to truly listen. Patrick Kieran reminded us that society is not something that just happens to us. It is something we help shape. The main thing is to engage, dialogue, bridge, and interact with people of all sorts. Unless we participate, we lose our ability to both influence the world and learn from it. As Dieter F. Uchtdorf reminded, one might ask, if the gospel is so wonderful, why would anyone leave? Sometimes we assume it is because they have been offended or lazy or sinful. Actually, it is not that simple. Some of our dear members struggle for years with the question of whether they should separate themselves from the church. From the LDS Living article, Understanding a Faith Crisis for Those Who Have Never Had One, we learn two important things. Many of those who lose faith experience an anguish similar to losing a loved one to death. Many fear talking to their leaders and their family for fear of being misunderstood, not wanting to hurt their testimonies, and worrying they will be ostracized. Most of them try to hold on as best they can, but their shelf eventually breaks. Part of common LDS parlance is to put challenging questions to their faith on a proverbial shelf. This is a spiritual coping mechanism that allows people to set aside a difficult topic and just go on faith in the meantime. If someone says to you, my shelf broke, it probably means that their shelf has exceeded its maximum load capacity and their crisis has begun. Many experiencing challenging questions feel alone and isolated. And as the renowned psychologist Brene Brown taught, isolation is worse than being alone. It is the feeling of hopelessness that one is locked out of the possibility of human connection. Your loved one will likely feel that no one will be able to understand what they are going through. You can help your loved one feel connection again by showing your interest to understand them. When you feel the time is right, you can ask questions like, can you tell me which questions you have struggled with the, with the most and why? Do you mind telling me about what led you to step away from the church? Or tell me about what you believe now. President Russell M. Nelson urged, is it possible for us to listen openly to a shocking experience without going into a state of shock ourselves? Can we listen without interrupting and without making snap judgments that slam shut the door of dialogue? It can remain open with the soothing reassurance that we believe in them and understand their feelings. Most members don't want to hear negative things about the church they hold dear, and they may see things completely different from their loved ones, but they don't have to let negative or uncomfortable feelings keep them from seeking to understand. Our compassionate listening can help them empty their hearts and find healing and renewal to know that they are understood and still loved despite any differences. Most of us know how to listen, but it's always good to review the fundamentals, some of which include put away all distractions, use verbal responses like okay or I see, allow for silence, pose open-ended questions like tell me more and what was it like to experience that, don't switch the conversation back to you, be present for them. The church historian Marlon K. Jensen lamented, often in the church when someone comes with a bit of a prickly question, he'll be met with a bishop who doesn't know the answer or says, get in line and don't question the prophet. And that isn't helpful in most cases. So we need to educate our leaders better to be empathetic and try to understand them. Sometimes that alone is enough to help someone through a hard time. But beyond that, I think we really need to figure out a way to live a little bit with people who may never get completely settled. Helpful key number four, if they are interested, point them to perspectives and resources you think might be helpful and explore the resources yourself as well. There are many resources and communities that can give your loved one helpful information and carry friends to support them along the way. It certainly won't work well just to throw a bunch of resources their way in the attitude of trying to fix them, but if they, and hopefully you, are interested, you can explore individually and together resources that might be helpful. Some of these resources will resonate more with some people and less with others, but it's good to know the options that are out there. I'll mention a few here, and I'll provide more in the notes below the video. Titles of some of the books written in the last 10 years that try to give people tools to consider while navigating faith challenges include The Crucible of Doubt, Reflections on the Quest for Faith by Terrell and Fiona Givens, When Mormons Doubt, A Way to Save Relationships and Seek a Quality Life by John Ogden, Letters to a Young Mormon by Adam Miller, Planted, Belief and Belonging in an Age of Doubt by Patrick Mason, Navigating a Mormon Faith Crisis by Thomas Wortham McConkie, Worth the Wrestle by Sherry Dew, and Bridges, Ministering to Those That Question by David Osler. Some principles in these books will likely resonate with your loved one and others might not. There are multiple organizations that produce scholarship, deepening understanding of Mormon history and theology, offer defenses against criticisms, or offer evidence in support of the church. 
There may be aspects of these organizations that might help your loved one and other aspects that might not. People can feel free to check them out and take from them what they like and reject what they don't like. But regardless, there is a lot to be learned from these organizations. They include the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship, Saints Unscripted, Book of Mormon Central, the Interpreter Foundation, Faith Matters Foundation, the Latter-day Saints Questions and Answers YouTube channel, the Dialogue Foundation, the Sunstone Foundation, and church publications such as the church website and, as mentioned, the Joseph Smith Papers and the Gospel Topics Essays. There are also support communities with online and in-person options that cater to people who are in different places on the spectrum of belief. Most of these communities will help your loved one with five common things. Number one, help them know they are not alone, but in good company, because it's normal and natural to struggle with questions. Number two, help them learn to take their time and process what they are going through, since these issues are extremely complex. And while they are taking their time, to do some introspection into the strengths and limitations their prior experiences bring to their truth-seeking quest. Number three, help them remember their past spiritual experiences and things they still love about their religion, even as they wrestle with certain aspects of it. Number four, give them helpful information and paradigms to aid them in turning their experience into a growth-promoting journey. Of course, they have their agency to determine if they will grow into the church or out of it. And number five, encourage them not to jump to conclusions, but to look to heaven for help and stay close to the Holy Spirit and open to God revealing something new to them they hadn't considered before. I know this doesn't work for everyone, but I wanted to share my personal experience that when I try to remain close to my heavenly parents and the Savior through prayer and feasting on the Word of God, there is a spiritual power and nurturing, I feel, that always strengthens me, whether I'm experiencing calm waters or navigating the rough waters of challenging questions. Here are five communities that seek to support people in their faith challenges in different ways. Likely one or more of these groups will fit your loved one, but certainly not all of them will. Number one, Waters of Mormon. This Facebook group is a community of Latter-day Saints who have concerns with aspects of the church, but still seek to engage with it in meaningful ways. Number two, the Listen, Learn, and Love podcast. Richard Osler, a former Singles Ward Bishop, has a huge compassionate heart and lets people tell their story and supports them in their struggles and efforts including spreading understanding and love for LGBTQ Latter-day Saints. Number three, Uplift Community of Faith. This is an online and in-person community that seeks to minister to those that question and tries to offer them tools and paradigms to help them rebuild their faith. Number four, Marriage on a Tightrope. For those who have a spouse who has questions or is undergoing a faith transition, this group has over 1,000 couples going through the same thing who can help with great advice, caring support. I'll also share two quick honorary mentions as well, Mormon Spectrum, and my new Restoration Table Facebook group. These groups seek to bring active members and former members together so they can learn from each other's unique viewpoints and become friends by letting love prevail over their differences. There are many other resources and communities out there, but those are a few of the good ones. Helpful key number five, embrace the potential for growth through these challenges. It's supposed to be hard. If it wasn't hard, everyone would do it. The hard is what makes it great. As you start to better understand the nature of what your loved one is going through, it can be helpful to remember that their struggle is not necessarily a negative thing, but can be a positive growing opportunity. Remember this from the famous Stoic Seneca, no man is more unhappy than he who never faces adversity. The BYU professor of psychology Sam Hardy opined that to get where you really internalize your religion, you have to grapple with it a little bit. If we choose to learn about our loved ones wrestle with their faith, Dallin H. Oaks reminds us that it is the nature of mortality that there be an opposition in all things. Given that fact, I think we need to be sensitive to the positions of those who don't agree with us, and we need to have a setting where different points of view can be worked out. Out of a respectful discussion can come improved policies. It's important to remember that when we avoid difficult conversations, we trade short-term discomfort for long-term dysfunction. In fact, this refining process is a natural part of life as we progress through the different stages of maturity and adult development, going from a black and white way of looking at the world to embracing more nuance and complexity. Because, as we know through the lessons of nature, for a seed to achieve its greatest expression, it must come completely undone. The shell cracks, its insides come out, and everything changes. To someone who doesn't understand growth, it would look like complete destruction. As human experience teaches us, the thing that breaks your heart is the very thing you were born to help heal. Some of the spiritual giants throughout the ages have wrestled with extreme challenges to their faith, and God made them stronger for it, so we need not fear. Joseph Smith at one point cried out in doubt and disbelief, Oh God, where art thou? And remember that before his grove became sacred, it was his darkest place. 
and Mother Teresa, of all people, surprisingly suffered a long period of feeling separated from God. She once said, Jesus has a very special love for you, but as for me, the silence and the emptiness is so great that I look and do not see, listen and do not hear. Remember that the Lord promised that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. I know for me personally, as I've tried to undertake a rigorous examination of my faith, I've encountered many inspiring things and I've also encountered many challenging things. I'm just glad that I've continued to engage in the wrestle and I've met a lot of really great people along the way. Some people will feel that the growing they do through this wrestle will point them to remain in the church and some will feel they are growing out of the church, but you can at least offer your compassionate ear and the resources and communities we discussed. Helpful key number six, remember that despite the divine inspiration prophets receive, they are still subject to human error. There is room to validate some of your loved one's concerns about the words and actions of past and current prophets without abandoning your testimony of prophets or the restoration. It is a natural human tendency to hero worship, to give leaders more authority over our lives than is healthy and to think they are more perfect than is possible. M. Russell Ballard lamented that too many people think church leaders and members should be perfect or nearly perfect. Our leaders have the best intentions, but sometimes we make mistakes. Terrell and Fiona Givens profoundly reminded us that airbrushing our leaders, past or present, is both a wrenching of the scriptural record and a form of idolatry. It generates an inaccurate paradigm that creates false expectations and disappointment. God specifically said that he called weak vessels so we wouldn't place our faith in their strength or power, but in God's. The prophetic mantle represents priesthood keys, not a level of holiness or infallibility. That is why our scripturally mandated duty to the prophets and apostles is not to idolize them, but to uphold and sustain them by the prayer of faith. The Lord said this about calling Joseph, His word shall ye receive as if from mine own mouth in all patience and faith. And the Lord in Doctrine and Covenants said he called Joseph so he could do his work through the weak things of the earth. Lorenzo Snow gave us some great insight when he recollected, I saw Joseph Smith the prophet do things which I did not approve of, and yet I thank God that he would put upon a man who had these imperfections, the power and authority which he had placed upon him. For I knew I myself had weaknesses, and I thought there was a chance for me. Bruce R. McConkie taught that despite all their inspiration, prophets are yet mortal men with imperfections common to mankind in general. They have their opinions and prejudices and are left to work out their problems without inspiration in many instances. One example of what Bruce R. McConkie taught is when he said this, soon after the lifting of the priesthood and temple ban from blacks, forget everything that I have said or what President Brigham Young or whomsoever has said in days past that is contrary to the present revelation. We spoke with a limited understanding and without the light and knowledge that has now come into the world. One need not look any further than the Bible to prove this point. As Patrick Mason pointed out in his book, Planted, Belief and Belonging in an Age of Doubt, even the Bible's exemplars are deeply and often tragically, we, we might say scandalously flawed. Adam and Eve fall. Noah gets drunk. Abraham lies. Sarah is jealous. Jacob deceives. Joseph deceives. Moses murders. Joshua and Saul commit genocide. David commits adultery. Jonah runs from God. Elisha summons bears to kill 42 children for calling him bald. And these are the good guys. After reading the Old Testament, we should not be particularly surprised that our modern day Zion has snares, stumbling blocks, and offenses. I am and should be troubled any time I see scandals in Zion, just as many of the events recorded in the Old Testament are deeply troubling to me. But scripture reminds me not to be surprised by Zion's failings and to believe that God can redeem his people in spite of their many missteps. J. Reuben Clark admitted that there have been occasions when even the president of the church and his preaching and teaching has not been moved upon by the Holy Ghost and that this has happened about matters of doctrine. We are not infallible in our judgment, he said, and we err, but our constant prayer is that the Lord will guide us in our decisions, and we are trying so to live that our minds will be open to his inspiration. The church will know, by the testimony of the Holy Ghost and the body of the members, whether the brethren in voicing their views are moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and in due time that knowledge will be made manifest. Jeffrey R. Holland pleaded for us to be kind regarding human frailty, your own as well as that of those who serve with you in a church led by volunteer mortal men and women, except in the case of his only perfect begotten son. Imperfect people are all God has ever had to work with. Acknowledging the humanity of prophets can be extremely beneficial, I believe, for five reasons. Number one, it's in line with truth. Jesus was the only human being who never erred. Number two, it's healthy and healing to acknowledge human mistakes and damaging to not do so. Number three, for many, their faith will not be as shaken when they discover errors among church leaders. Number four, Instead of the focus being on how holy these prophets are, our focus will more correctly be on how amazing God is that he can do such amazing works through such flawed human beings. 
And number five, if God can still do miracles through his imperfect prophets, then there, there is hope he can still do miracles through our imperfect efforts as well. Helpful key number seven, hold space for a diversity of belief within the body of Christ. Joseph F. Smith acknowledged that church members are not all united on every principle. The prophets and apostles have often been diametrically opposed to each other regarding significant historical, doctrinal, social, and procedural issues. They have sometimes worked out those differences and other times have learned how to coexist despite their differences, focusing on love over being right. Joseph Smith intended for us to peacefully coexist despite our differences when he famously said, I did not like the old man being called up for erring in doctrine. It looks too much like the Methodists. Methodists have creeds which a man must believe or be asked out of their church. I want the liberty of thinking and believing as I please. Jeffrey R. Holland exemplified the spirit of what Joseph said when he said this regarding the Book of Mormon. We have many people who are members of the church who do not have some burning conviction as to the Book of Mormon's origins, but we're not going to invite somebody out of the church over that any more than we would anything else about degrees of belief or steps of hope or steps of conviction. We would say, this is the way I see it, and this is the faith I have. This is the foundation on which I'm going forward. If I can help you work toward that, I'd be glad to, but I don't love you less. I don't distance you more. I don't say you're unacceptable to me as a person or even as a Latter-day Saint if you can't make that step or move to the beat of that drum. We really don't want to sound smug. We don't want to seem uncompromising and insensitive. Many in the church see the gospel in a black and white way. For them, it is easy to define the lines that are set. In reality, many doctrines are more nuanced than that. For example, the church has no official position on what the cause of homosexuality is, the age of the earth, evolution, caffeine, whether polygamy will be practiced in the next life, eternal progression between kingdoms, what exactly members are to pay their tithing on, and how figurative or allegorical many Bible stories are meant to be taken. These are much more complex issues than many at first thought had assumed. Because we don't believe in blind obedience in the church and because we believe that prophets from time to time can err in their pronouncements or implementation of practices, there is room for members to think for themselves and feel like their inspiration from the Holy Ghost disagrees with their leaders. Here is one example to illustrate. Dallin H. Oaks in the 2018 B1 celebration, which honored 40 years since the lifting of the priesthood and temple ban for blacks, said this, I observed the pain and frustration experienced by those who suffered these restrictions and those who criticized them and sought for reasons. I studied the reasons then being given and could not feel the confirmation of the truth of any of them. This is significant. This is a current apostle acknowledging that his experience with the Holy Spirit didn't back up some of the teachings of prophets and apostles. Hubie Brown reminded us that as long as men and women remain humble and teachable, people should express their problems and opinions and be unafraid to think without fear of ill consequences. Neither fear of consequence nor any kind of coercion should ever be used to secure uniformity of thought in the church. We must preserve freedom of the mind in the church and resist all efforts to suppress it. So we should feel comfortable not only sharing what we love about the gospel, but also ways we can see room for improvement. I believe God wants us to all be a part of the line upon line ongoing restoration. Revelation often comes from the top, and there are plenty of examples also when the body of Christ can influence it as well. Many who are leaving today feel, as Richard Bushman put it, switched off and squeezed out. They feel their testimonies are switched off because of church history or modern church issues and squeezed out from the social circles in their wards because their different opinions are met with judgment. It's always important to remember that when we have differing opinions, although we are passionate about them, if we express them with a spirit of love, respect, and humility, they are likely to be received much better. A friend of mine who is currently not attending said that she still shares so much common ground with the church and its members, and if she felt like she was wanted, accepted as is, and not seen as struggling, she would really consider still attending. According to the Bridges book, among those surveyed who have left the church, 90% of people say they want to remain in the church, but only 10% of them feel like their ward accepts them when they are authentic about their true opinions. It's important to remember that Jesus and his followers in the New Testament, although they boldly invited all to practice the way of the gospel, they nevertheless embraced everyone from all walks of life and honored their agency. As long as people were willing to unselfishly serve each other and not harm each other, there was no set of beliefs or practices they had to adhere to in order to feel like they were in full fellowship. It's important to remember that although religious rules can serve a purpose, we don't want to overemphasize them, like the Pharisees did, to the detriment of our ability to help people feel loved and not less than. 
the Relief Society General President Jean B. Bingham implored us to remember that until you have seen people who are different from you in lots of different ways, I think it's easy to get focused on a very narrow segment and feel like that is the only way to be. One of the best ways to form a good relationship is not to come in with assumptions or preconceived notions, keeping an open mind and an open heart. Sometimes we tend to pigeonhole people or we assume that they are a certain way because of a certain situation in their life or family. It is always surprising if you keep your mind open and your heart open. You find out lots of wonderful things about people that you might not have ever expected. And when you've experienced, when you've seen, when you've opened your heart to other people, you see that we all belong. The church historian Marlon K. Jensen lamented, I don't think we do well by those that don't fit our norms. The young man who doesn't serve a mission or who comes home early, the person with same gender attraction, the divorced woman, those who are different. I think if you meet the norm, if you're striving for the ideal and you're coming close to it, I think Mormonism is a glorious place to be. If you're not, if you're in some in-between state where you don't quite fit in, I don't think we've learned yet quite how to bring that person in. Although many members of the church are learning to be more inclusive, many still have much more room for improvement to live up to the vision shared by elders Uchtdorf and Holland in a fairly recent general conference. Dieter F. Uchtdorf powerfully taught, Brothers and sisters, dear friends, we need your unique talents and perspectives. The diversity of persons and peoples all around the globe is a strength of this church. Regardless of your circumstance, your personal history, or the strength of your testimony, there is room for you in this church. Come join with us. And to those who have left the path, please come back. Join again with us. Make us stronger. Come and add your talents, gifts, and energies to ours. We will all become better as a result. And Jeffrey R. Holland also powerfully taught, Remember, it is by divine design that not all the voices in God's choir are the same. It takes variety, sopranos and altos, baritones and basses to make rich music and harmony. When we disparage our uniqueness or try to conform to fictitious stereotypes, we lose the richness that God intended when he created a world of diversity. You are unique. You are irreplaceable. The loss of even one voice diminishes every other singer in this great mortal choir of ours, including the loss of those who feel they are on the margins of society or the margins of the church. There is room for the single, for the married, for large families, and for the childless. There is room for those who once had questions regarding their faith and room for those who still do. There is room for those with differing sexual attractions. Despite these beautiful messages about inclusivity, many people, because of their various situations in life, don't feel like church doctrines are available to them. And it can be very tough to stay with the church as a result for many people. Helpful key number eight, identify and celebrate the beliefs and values you still share with them. Although your loved one's journey may create some differences in the beliefs and values you once shared, there will likely still be many things you both still value, and it will strengthen your relationship tremendously if you seek to identify, focus on, and celebrate the positive values you still share. Common values people usually still agree on, even after their loved one has gone through a faith transition, include the importance of family relationships, kindness, education, hard work, fidelity, compassion, forgiveness, humility, humanitarian service, and fun, wholesome recreational activities. For those with a spouse who is experiencing challenging questions or a faith transition, please remember to keep in consideration Paul's admonition. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. When considering how to respond to your spouse's new difference with you regarding faith, these are some important questions to ask. Are they still faithful to you? Do they work hard to share family responsibilities with you? Are they kind to you and your children? It depends on the situation, of course, but many couples are increasingly learning how to navigate a mixed faith marriage. And although it's not always easy or ideal, they focus on the common ground they still hold and can build on for their marriage and family. Helpful key number nine, trust in God and in their journey. It may be hard not to worry about how your loved one's life will turn out or whether or not you will be together in the next life. However, it will lead to a more happy relationship with them in this life if you trust in God and trust your loved one's journey. The church teaches that God works in the lives of the 99.9% .9 of his children on earth who are not members of the church. So you can trust that he will still participate in the lives of those who have experienced a change of faith about the church. And remember, the church believes in eternal progression. You can trust the seeking spirit of your loved one and let God judge their hearts. Dieter F. Uchtdorf reminded us that in this church that honors personal agency so strongly, that was restored by a young man who asked questions and sought answers, we respect those who honestly search for truth. It may break our hearts when their journey takes them away from the church we love and the truth we have found, but we honor the right to worship Almighty God according to the dictates of their own conscience, just as we claim that privilege for ourselves. Helpful key number 10, love them unconditionally. 
If you do invite them to consider ideas and resources you think they will find helpful, make sure to follow that invitation up with the reassurance of your love for them. M. Russell Ballard sent this wise statement. If I have family or friends who are less active, how far do I go in my attempts to bring them back? My answer is please do not preach to them. Your family members or friends already know the church's teachings. They don't need another lecture. What they need, what we all need, is love and understanding, not judging. Share your positive experiences of living the gospel. Also be genuinely interested in their lives, their successes, and their challenges. Always be warm, gentle, loving, and kind. I recently heard of a ward that threw a party for a sister who had recently left the church to let her know how much they were thankful for her and how much they still loved her and wanted to be a part of her life, even though she still was leaving. Now that is Christ-like love in action. Here are some helpful phrases taken from the book Bridges that exemplify the spirit you want to embody while interacting with your loved one. No matter what you say, I will love and respect you. I understand you have different beliefs and it won't change our friendship. I will do my best to understand your perspective and your feelings. I promise to keep this conversation confidential. I will just listen. I won't preach, give advice, or tell you that you are wrong. Even if you hold different beliefs than I do, I know you are a good person. And I love you. To review, these are 10 helpful keys for responding to a loved one's questions or faith transition. Number one, understand the nature of modern challenges to faith and the church's efforts to respond to them. Number two, honor their questions. Number three, seek to understand, listen, and don't judge. Number four, if they're interested, point them to resources and support you think might be helpful for them. Number five, embrace the potential for growth through these challenges. Number six, Remember that despite the divine inspiration prophets receive, they are still subject to human error. Number seven, hold space for a diversity of belief within the body of Christ. Number eight, identify and celebrate the values you still share with them. Number nine, trust in God and in their journey. And number 10, love them unconditionally. Once again, I'd love to hear your story in the comments. What experiences have you or a loved one of yours had with challenging questions or faith transition? I'd love to know what has been the hardest part about it and what has been the most helpful to you to try to navigate through it. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed it. And please share this with any of your family or friends that you feel might benefit from it. If you like the content in this video, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and give us a good review on your podcast app. And please join us at the Restoration Table Facebook group where we share our favorite gems from the restoration, minister to one another in our struggles, and seek to understand each other's differing viewpoints. Take care everyone and we'll see you next time.